So very happy to be here. Um, it's a pleasure to, to share a, an hour and a half with you. Um, so yeah, I, I will begin by just presenting a few ideas and then a, we will devote the rest of the time to um, answer any question that you, may, that you may have. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, the title of my presentation is going to be Reasoning for Data Visualization, which is the, the main thing that I am thinking about, that I have been thinking about in the, for the past a few months, how to make good choices whenever we design a data visualization, right? Before I, I begin, by the way, talking, um, I, I need to give credit to the artist who created the illustration in the background in some of the title slides. Um, you all know her, Nadi Bremer, famous visualization designer. A, a while ago, we collaborated in a project titled Why Do Cats and Dogs, which is uh, really cute and a lot of fun. It's basically, it's a Google project, a, a project sponsored and paid for by Google. Uh, it's a project that visualizes a, what people search for when we search for why is my cat doing that or why is the dog you know pooping in the front of my door or something like that the kinds of searches that people make when uh, when we search for what our pets a, 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 a like to do or are doing uh, the animations are by juliana shen and they are absolutely beautiful and you should all check it out this is just an aside just to give a uh, juliana and a uh, credit for these beautiful illustrations that again will appear in the title slides of my presentation. Anyway, so yeah, I have several books. The latest ones, The Truthful Art, and most recently, How Chat Sly, which uh, seems to me that it's more timely than ever, considering what's going on with coronavirus and also the upcoming election in 2000 and now this year in November. It seems that we are going to have a deluge of bad graphics or misleading graphics, but that's not what I want to talk about today. Um, because, I mean, if you want to learn what how Chelsea is about, you can just read the book. So it will be a waste of time, I think, of your time to um, go over uh, the book itself. So I'm going to go beyond the book. And what I'm going to do is to give you a heads up to what I am working on at the moment, because I'm already working on a new book in collaboration with uh, a designer who currently works for the Washington Post. Her name is Alyssa Fowers. We are going to co-write a book that will be published probably in the fall of 2021 or the spring of 2022, we'll see, because a publishing houses' um, plans are, are shifting and changing quite a lot uh, because of the pandemic. And the working title of the book is going to be The Art of Insight, How Great Visualization Designers Think, or How to Think About Data Visualization. And the core idea of the book is that whenever we are, uh, whenever we are designing a graphic, we need to equip ourselves or we need to give ourselves and others reasons, reasons for the uh, um, uh, changes or for the design choices that we make when we are designing our, our, our graphics. The notion of reason, by the way, which I am planning to define in the book itself, is, is widely used in the, in the literature about a moral philosophy, which is one of the areas that I'm most interested in the philosophy of ethics, the, the philosophy of morals, the philosophy of how to be a good person in the world, right? And one of my favorite authors in this, in this area, uh, his name was uh, Derek Parfit, who has this wonderful book titled On What Matters, which is it's like the Lord of the Rings. It's huge. It's like 1,000 pages. And it is divided into three volumes. And I'm not claiming that I have read the three of them. I only read the first one for now. But in the first one, which is the key book, the key uh, piece in, the, in, in this series of books, uh, he defines what a reason is. And basically, a reason is something that leads you to uh, operate or to act in a certain way. You give yourself facts, and those facts give you reasons, right? And they give you reasons when those facts count toward either in favor or against doing something or believing something or desiring something in one way or another. And this is what, this is sort of like the core idea of this new book. It's like how you can reason, how we can all reason about, about visualization. Now, the reason why I'm going to sort of like create this frame a, of thinking for the book is that I feel that for many years, visualization has been taught too much as a set of rules that are set in stone. And, and I blame myself also. I have written like that myself do this, don't do that. I don't think that we should operate like that in data visualization uh, anymore, right? When we design a visualization, our personal opinions matter, right? Our personal choices, our personal 
uh, preferences. Those also give us reasons, right, to operate in one way or another. But those cannot be the only reasons that we have, right? Like our, our personal preferences in terms of a style or in terms of there are other better reasons, such as empirical reasons, for example, right? But at the same time, reasons are flexible and reasons need to be sort of like uh, made to fight against one another, right? The process of designing a visualization is like some sort of dialogue that you establish with yourself in which you weigh different reasons to do something or not to do something. And sometimes you also need to have this dialogue uh, with other people. You need to equip yourself with justified choices. You need to be able to ground your um, choices in either empirical evidence or your experience or common practice and conventions, all those provide you, give you reasons to operate or to act in one way or another. And one key a message of the book is that visualization can, the rules of visualization, so to speak, are really not set in stone. They are not set in stone, right? So they are not really rules, right? They are not, they are principles, they are guidance, they are like guidelines, they are, and all those are evolving and changing. Right? And each visualization in this sense is a little bit unique. I'm going to give you just one example. How many times have you heard, right? And I've said, I've said this myself, you know, bar charts should always start at zero, right? Or, well, uh, and another one that is very common also, don't use pie charts, pie charts are evil, right? Well, that, that's bullshit, right? Pie charts may be useful in certain, in certain cases, but let's reason about this rule, so to speak, right? Bar charts should always start at zero. This is, some, this is a rule of visualization design that I have promoted myself. And the reason why I have done this in the past is that if you truncate the Y axis of a, of a bar chart, that distorts the, uh, the proportions of the bars, right? And this, that is bad, right? So we we'll never do it, all right? But at the same time, those of us who write about visualization who say that it is bad to truncate the y-axis of a bar chart, at the same time, we are much more flexible with the y-axis of graphics that are not based on length or height to encode the data, right? Graphics that use, for example, position, or a slope, such as a line chart, we usually say, well, in this case, it is fine, it is fine. Well, is it really fine, right? Let's reason about this. If when a reader reads a bar chart, what the reader takes into consideration or what his or her mind focuses on is the length of the bars, the overall area, the overall size of the bars, then truncating the y-axis of a bar graph is bad. That's bad because we are lying with that distortion. But we don't really know that readers do this. There's a lot of research to be done. We don't really know if a majority or a crushing majority of people focus on the overall area of the bar chart or they only focus on the upper edge of the bar graph. Because if they only focus on the bar on the upper edge of the bar graph, there is really not a difference between truncating the y-axis of the bar chart or truncating the, the axis of the line chart. There is no different at all, difference at all. So if it is right in one, in one case, it will be right on the other case. And if it is wrong in one, the other case, it will also be wrong on the other case. However, I still recommend not to truncate the axis of a bar graph, but this has nothing to do with distortion. It has nothing to do with lying to people. It has to do with mere logic, the logic of encoding, right? Visualization is based on encodings. We get numbers and then we encode the numbers using certain properties of objects, right? Those properties can be the height, the length, the position, the area, the angle, the slope, the color, etc. The method of encoding in a bar chart is the length, right? That's how bar charts are created, right? The length measured from a common zero scale. Therefore, out of logic, right, if you truncate the axis of a bar chart, right, that goes against the logic of the bar chart. It breaks the sort of like how the bar chart is, that is actually created, right? So I still have a reason to recommend not to truncate the uh, axis of a bar chart, but it is not that the bar chart is distorted per se, because if the bar chart has a, for, has a scale, you can read the scale, the same way that you can read the scale on a line chart, okay? So this is the type of thinking process that I think that we all need to need to develop. It's this dialogue with oneself and this dialogue with other people that may, may lead us to make better choices when we design visualizations. There are certain kinds of questions that I am going to try to address in the book, and these questions will sort of like structure the, uh, the book itself. And this list of questions that I'm going to give you is tentative. I may, we may change it, change the order of them, but here they are. 
why to visualize, what to visualize, who to visualize for, how much to visualize, how to visualize it, what style to use, and what words to add. And there, are many, there may be others that I may discover through the, the process of writing itself. So let's go over them one by one very quickly. The first one is to ask ourselves, why should my visualization exist in the first place, right? And one of the thing that, things that I'm planning to write about in the book is that I sort of envision two types of visualizations. The first type of visualizations is the visualizations that I would like to call, why not? Why not visualizations, right? And why not visualizations are visualizations such as Nari's, a wonderful, why do cats and dogs, right? By why not visualization, he said, if your topic is, doesn't affect people's lives in a consequential way, it's just a fun topic, right, right? Your visualization is, why not? Why not designing this? It's fun, right? It's, let's publish it. It, it will not affect anybody's lives in any meaningful way. Therefore, why not making it, right? But there are other types of visualizations that I would call why visualizations. Why should this visualization exist? and be published, right? And I will try to provide several examples of these types of graphics in the book. I'm going to just give you uh, one example that may help us uh, understand that the key message or the key idea that we need to consider when asking ourselves, why should my visualization exist, will be to weigh the benefits of publishing that visualization versus the possible harm that that visualization may, may cause. Take a look at this one, for instance. This graphic was published by a newspaper called the, um, uh, the Journal News in upstate New York um, after there was a terrible mass shooting in an elementary school in the United States called Sandy Hook. This happened in 2012. Well, a few weeks later, this newspaper, the Journal News, published this map, which is not available online anymore, but there are plenty of screenshots because it was very controversial. What this map is showing, each one of those dots represents one person in upstate New York, in several counties of upstate New York, who have a gun permit, right? In the United States, you can acquire a gun permit. It's perfectly legal. You go, you apply, you get it, and you get a gun permit. You get a, you get a paper that you take home. However, your data is a, 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 belongs to the public record. Anybody can request that data through a FOIA request. And this is what this organization did. They requested the data. And then they mapped the data this way, right? So the publisher of this uh, newspaper defended their decision, justified their decision, saying, we felt that sharing the information about gun permits in our area was important in the aftermath of the Newtown shootings. Well, really? Why? Why is this relevant? These are not mass shooters. These are not, you know, killers or criminals. This is just anyone. I could, I could get a gun permit. Even if I don't have a gun at home, I could still get a gun permit just in case. And then my name will be, be, uh, become part of the public record and then you are going to visualize it, right? So I am not going to say that this, this is wrong. This is something that I will try to argue a little bit more and a little bit more deeply in the book. But it's a great example to talk about this why, right? And they related questions to this why, which are, why should this data be made public? That's in the first place. Why should it be public? And why should it be made public through a map? Are there significant differences between making it public in a table and making it public on a map? There might be. Why should it be this type of map? Right? There are other types of maps, right? For instance, uh, this is related to the following question. Even if we decided that it is worth publishing as a map, wouldn't a different map be better? For instance, in this particular case, instead of using a dot map to pinpoint the position of every person, you could aggregate the data and make it more abstract and do, for example, a county level map or a district level map. And then instead of showing every single person with their addresses, right? So you could locate that person on the map, you could aggregate and say, you know, in this district or in this block or in this neighborhood, there are 10 people with gun permits. In that way, uh, the privacy of those people will be preserved. And at the same time, you can still inform people about how many people have gun permits in your area. So this is the way that we try to weigh the possible consequences of our actions against the possible benefits that our actions have, which they should have justified it even more. Why do they think or why do they think that sharing the information about gun permits is important. Why is it important? You need to explain that to me. I don't think that it is important just because I'm just arguing, you know, doing, doing the devil's advocate position over here. I don't think that it is important. Why is it important? These are all legal, legal permits, right? That's not what we need to know in order to identify um, possible mass shootings in the, in the future, right? So this data is completely irrelevant. 
to that topic. You need to argue more if you want to justify the publishing in this, in this data because the data, this data may be very harmful. Now, take this case or cases like this related to coronavirus. How many visualizations of a coronavirus have we all seen? Some of them better, some of them worse. We also need to consider the possible harmful consequences of our, of our coronavirus visualizations. And for this, I would, I would recommend that you take a look at this article by Amanda Makulek in which she argues from the Data Visualization Society, in which she makes this sort of like argument about how to make good choices whenever we are going to visualize data related to the pandemic. By the way, before I forget, all these slides that I'm showing, I have already exported, exported them as a PDF. And once I finish talking, I will share them through the chat window and the question and answers window, so you will all be able to download them and use them at will, right? So being designers and data scientists and statisticians, I think that we, are all, we all read too much into the literature of our fields, right? We spend a lot of time reading about how to make better visualizations, how to be a better designer, how to be a better statistician. We need to broaden the scope and we need to start reading deeply into the literature of moral reasoning and ethics. Unfortunately, there, is plenty of, there are plenty of books that you can consult as communicators and visualization designers. For instance, reading a little bit about the ethics of journalism can benefit everybody, I think, because I think that this, there's a lot to be read and a lot to be learned. The Ethics of Engineering, Technology and Values, that's a, a, a book about the ethics of engineering. The Ethics of Information, right, by uh, Luciano Floridi. And also very, you know, very recently, Ruined by Design by Mike Montero was published a few, uh, a year ago or something like that. All these books, you know, can help us. Um, become better listeners in terms of how, when, when we talk about or when we think about the possible consequences of our actions. Second question, what to visualize? Who to visualize? Who, what or who are we visualizing? And who or what are we not visualizing? Who is included in our graphics? Who is not included in our graphics? This is all related to um, understanding what it is that our data is measuring and what it is that our data is not measuring. And the result of that is that visualizations that may be, be, be worse or better. In how charts lie, I have several examples of these. For instance, I, I talk about one case in which one student of mine, Luis Melgar, who is right now a um, data journalist at the Wall Street Journal, he was working on his uh, capstone project for my class and he came to me, we had this first preliminary meeting in which he showed me some maps and some charts and some data about the topic that he had chosen, which was um, a homelessness in Florida, student homelessness in Florida. How many students, right, young people, are homeless in Florida? And when he showed me the first maps and charts that he created, I was shocked because I saw that in some counties, this is a county level map of Florida, in some counties, one out of five of the students are homeless here. Homeless people, one out of five, that's a lot. And even in the, in the counties that are, have lower rates, so it's, like, it's still one or 1% 1 or 5% of, of students are homeless in Miami-Dade. This is where, we, where I live. That's, that's incredible. 5% of the students are homeless. And Luis said, you know, but be careful because uh, before you understand these graphics, you need to understand what it is that they are measuring, right? Because your idea of a homeless person is probably someone who has to live on the streets. But that is not how the state of Florida defines a homeless person. For the state of Florida, a homeless person is simply someone who doesn't have a permanent home. So if a student, for example, needs to change homes two or three times a year, perhaps her or his parents are divorced, and then the student needs to go live with her parent, then with his, or sorry, with his mother, then with her mother, and then they need to change homes several times throughout a year. That student always has a roof on top of her head, but at the same time, she's a homeless. She will be a homeless person just because she doesn't have a permanent home. So either of those definitions, person living on the street or person not having a permanent home, both of them are acceptable. But in order to understand what the graphic is showing, we need to tell people what it is that they are seeing. And we need to understand it ourselves. How many times have, have I seen, I have, and again, I, I am to blame being a journalist. How many times have I made a graphic in which I cannot really understand exactly what the data means, what the definition of the data are, right? And those are incredibly important because sometimes uh, just by rushing to visualize something, you may, you know, you may make errors. You may, 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 may make mistakes, right? And I'm going to show you a mistake that I described in, in how to apply as well, but for not looking into deeply into the data, what the data means, what is being counted, what is not being counted. A while ago, a Christopher Ingraham, who is a great data journalist who works for the Washington Post, 
Years ago, before he was hired by the Washington Post, he had a, his own personal web blog uh, that I think was called the Wonk blog or something like that. And he published the following story. Kansas is the nation's porn capital, according to Pornhub. This was published years ago. Well, apparently, you know, if you gather all the data from Pornhub, and Pornhub, which is a, always a website in which you can see porn for, porn for free, uh, Pornhub apparently releases their data every year. So you can download it, and you can play with it, and you can have fun with it. And Chris decided to have some fun with the data, right? He calculated a Pornhub pages per capita, and he correlated that to voting patterns, right? And he created a, a, a scatter plot like this, right? In which you can see that there is a there is a, a clear linear association between voting for a Democrat, Democratic candidate, Barack, Barack Obama, that's a horizontal axis, percent voting for Democratic candidate Barack Obama in 2012, and porn hub pages consumption per capita. Right? The more we vote Democratic, the more porn people consume on average. And as you can see, there's a clear outlier, Kansas. <laughs> what is going on with Kansas? That's so much fun. Well, Whenever we see a pattern like this in the data, we should always be suspicious, right? Because what is going on with Kansas? We, can all make, we all love to make up you know, stories in our mind as to whether why you know, people in Kansas consume so much porn. But when you see something so extreme, you need to be a little bit skeptical. And Chris corrected this story later on because he discovered that this is a glitch in the data. And this is what, 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 what the glitch is about. Apparently, in the past, when Pornhub release their data. The data had a little bit of a footnote that you needed to be aware of, which is the following. Let's say that I am right now in Miami, Florida, and I type in my computer pornhub.com, and I enter in Pornhub, and I start seeing porn pages. Well, Pornhub will know that there is a person or an IP address in Kendall, Florida, very close to Miami, Kendall, Florida, who is visiting three or four pages, and I will become part of Pornhub's um, a database. However, what about if I use a VPN, something that will mask my IP address? Well, I don't know how they deal with that at the moment, but apparently in the past, what they did in their data set is that if they couldn't locate your position, the position of your computer, your address, your IP address in your computer, they defaulted you, the Pornhub consumer, to this center, to the geographic center of the continental United States which happens to be in Kansas, very close to the boundary, the border with Nebraska. Nobody lives there. There is nobody there. There are only cows and grass over there. But, you know, many people were located in that point just because they were defaulted to that position. They were using VPNs or other methods to mask their own position. So the data may still be useful, right? But you need to be aware of this glitch to control for this glitch. Anyway, so... Talking about who is counted, who is not being counted, how to reason about what we are counting or not, and how to define, et cetera, et cetera. I think that anybody who is interested in working on data visualization needs to first become good at reasoning about numbers. And if you're a statistician or a data scientist, you're already educated in that. That's not what you need, probably. Although you could read a little bit about inclusion in data visualization. Who is being counted and who is not being counted? Unfortunately, the literature about this is increasing very rapidly. In the past couple of years, we had Invisible Women by Caroline Criado Perez, which is great. It's a great book. This same year, we have Data Feminism by Catherine Dignaccio and Lauren Klein, which are I strongly recommend. And also an initiative put together by statistician Heather Cross, called a We All Count. And all these things deal with um, inclusion and, and inequities and inequalities in, in data. And I would really, really recommend that you read them. And if you don't have formal training in statistics, and that is my case, I'm not a statistician, I'm a journalist, you need to read about how to reason about numbers, how to think about numbers. Unfortunately, again, the literature about that is growing also quite quickly. Naked Statistics is a great intro. The Art of Statistics was published this year, and many other books that I have been, that I recommend in my own books because they are useful for anyone who wants to think about these. And you also need to think about uncertainty. Right? This is just an aside. The problem with charts sometimes, and this is something that I address in how chat slide. The problem with charts sometimes is that they look very sharp. They look very precise. They look very accurate. Candidate A is having 45%. Candidate B is, is going to have 42%. And it seems that candidate A is higher than candidate B. But then you discover that the confidence interval around those numbers is very wide, right? So that is the uncertainty. That uncertainty, in that case, that confidence interval, 
needs to be shown and it needs to be explained because if the difference is so small between those two candidates, it's probably because it's just random noise, right? It's just random noise. There's really no difference, right? So in order to read about this, I, I have put together a, a, a list of resources, papers, readings, etc., that I have been collecting throughout the years about how to first interpret uncertainty and then how to visualize it. This is one of my, my own interests in the past, past few years as well. Who to visualize for? This is critical, right? Think about your audience, right? But it's not, it, we need to go beyond that, right? We need to go a little bit beyond thinking about our audience. I don't know who my audience is, right? We should test our graphics more often, right? Doing either formal or informal testing, showing our graphics to normal, quotation marks in their normal people, and observing how they read them. Because sometimes we assume that, you know, I'm a professional designer, I have 20 years of experience designing visualization, of course I will be able to design for the, this audience. And, you know, presenting your graphics to an audience is the most humbling experience because you will see how people misinterpret the graphics that follow the rules of visualization. So testing is incredibly important. But not only that, not only that. Also, we need to think about the level of literacy that those readers have and how we can address that. One of the things that I mentioned in How to Slide is that there is this survey by the Pew Research Center that in 2014 discovered that only, quotation marks in there, only 63% of Americans can read a scatter plot correctly, only, right? And they, they framed this story, they conducted a survey and they asked the, this, this sample people, a sample of people several questions, and one of them was about this scatter plot. How to read this, right? It, it was a grammatical question, right? How do you read this, right? Obviously, the grammatical level of understanding here is that each dot is a country, the horizontal position means something, and then the vertical position means something else. That's a grammatical understanding of the chart. And only 63% of people could read this graphic. The other 37% could not read this graphic. They were, interpretations were all over the place. Oh, this thing is, ch is showing change over time or comparing different, what, that's, not what, that's not really what the chart is showing, right? Well, the Pure Research Center um, framed this story negatively, saying, you know, only 63% of people read this graphic correctly. Oh my God, one out of three people cannot read this graphic. But I think that we can flip that. And this is actually good news. It's good news that 63% of people can read this graphic correctly. I, I can assure you that if we can, could have conducted this same survey when I began my career, in 1997 or something like that, that percentage of people who can read a scatter plot correctly will be much lower. It is 63% right now, which is pretty high, pretty high, because the scatter plots have become more common in news media and people are more used to seeing them. 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, scatter plots were nowhere to be seen in news media. And why is that? Well, because we journalists love to uh, love circular reasoning or self-fulfilling prophecies. We knew that people don't, couldn't read a scatter plot, therefore never publish a scatter plot because that will confuse your readers. Readers, That's a self-defeating strategy, right? I usually, I used to argue many years ago, right? That that impulse of not publishing something because the reader will not understand it will lead you to a situation which your readers will never understand that graphic just because you never use it, right? You need to use it at least once and then explain it, right? So whenever you find this um, a objection by a colleague or by an editor, or by a boss saying, oh, our readers are not going to understand this graphic, right? That's a valid objection, right? Caring about people understanding your graphics is a valid reason not to publish a graphic. But if you believe that is the best way to represent your data, and a scatterplot is a great way to represent associations, you can argue this way. Well, yes, of course, I mean, people will not understand it, but if we explain how to read it, they will understand this particular graphic. And not only that, next time that they see a scatterplot, they will be able to read that scatterplot with no, no problem at all. They will be able to read it like that. So adding explanations to graphics is something that is not that novel. This is not that original. Think about Hans Rosling, for example. Probably most of you are familiar with the documentary that he did for the BBC years ago, in which he, before showing any graphic, he said, you know, here you have an axis for lifespan. And now I'm that's a vertical axis, right? I'm going to show you an axis for a wealth, right? And that's going to be the horizontal axis. So if you are down here, right, if you're in th that corner down there, your country is poor and sick, but if you are on this quadrant up here, your country is rich and healthy. 
And now I'm going to show you where the countries are in 1810, right? Most of them are poor and, 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 and unhealthy, right? Most of them, I'm going to make them appear, right? Continent by continent, that is Africa, Asia, Europe. Each color corresponds to a, to a continent. Each bubble is a country. And then the size of the bubble is proportional to the population. And now I'm going to show you how, and then the average is really low. Notice what, notice what he did before he showed the graphic. Before showing the data, he explained the symbols and the grammar of the graphic, how to read the graphic. And then he showed the data. And not only that, then he explained the data, right? He put himself behind the graphic and he used his, his fingers and his hands to show you the movement, right? The motion towards, you know, higher, you know, wider lifespans and also a more healthy and more wealthy, more wealthy countries. But before he showed anything, he explain the graphic and that's great because it actually helps people understand not just this graphic but any graphic of this kind or this type that they will see in the future more recently we have seen people doing like this with coronavirus graphics right which is great how many i mean i have seen complaints online of people you know re normal regular people complaining that they don't understand a logarithmic scale well sure of course logarithmic scales are quite unintuitive, right? But, you need, but if you explain how to read a logarithmic scale, people will understand it. So if you use a logarithmic scale, explain it, explain how to read it and why we use that scale. Or in this case, for instance, Brian Stelter uh, from CNN, he showed the famous flatten the curve graphic, but he didn't just show the graphic. He showed the graphic and then he put himself in front of the graphic, explaining, reinforcing, emphasizing what the graphic is describing. Providing these descriptions is critical, is super, super essential, right? Either verbal or um, uh, written. First of all, because you explained your graphic. And second of all, because it could also increase the accessibility of your graphic. One of the things that I have been advocating for recently is that whenever it is possible, if you publish a visualization in your website, right, to tell a story or to convey a message, if it is possible, and more often than not it is possible, provide a written description of that visualization, of, what, of the main points that that visualization is making. Think about visually impaired people. A visually impaired person will not be able to read your graphic. But if below your graphic you have a paragraph that talks about what that graphic is showing, the computer will be able to read that description out loud. And then the person who cannot see the graphic, they can still envision the graphic in their brains and, and sort of like get the main points that your graphic was going to show. This talk about inclusion is who we're talking to, right? How we include more people who, to make them able to read our graphics is something that is also, also interests me, right? The inclusion in data visualization, in visualization or accessibility. There is this article, for example, that I strongly recommend that you read, which talks about all these issues. You know, don't use, you know, a not colorblind safe color palettes, for instance, provide a written description. It gives some tips of how to make our graphics a little bit more accessible. How much to visualize, right? This is uh, also one of the pet peeves of mine are across all the books already. It's like coming from the world of journalism myself and graphic design, I have seen many people oversimplifying matters, right? Trying to show as little as possible, right? Try to edit it down, but edit things down too much and end the ending up not showing um, a, the amount of information that is necessary to tell the story correctly. And one example that I have used throughout the years is this one of the U.S. murder rate per 100,000 people, right? The murder rate increased in the 80s, came down during the 90s, stayed the same later. And then in the past three or four years, right, we see an uptick in, mur in the murder rate in the United States. And if we extend this line, right, the line continues increasing. Well, this chart, if you don't know what lies behind this chart, what is behind this chart, this chart can easily mislead you. Even if the chart per se is not wrong, if it is not put in context or explained to you, right, it will lie to you. Because the message that is conveying, if you don't know better, is that the United States is becoming more dangerous, right? The United States is becoming more dangerous because the murder rate per 100,000 people is increasing. Therefore, the country is becoming more dangerous. And this is not true. This is not true. The United States is a pretty safe country. Crimes are, crime rates are relatively low, certainly not as low as they are you know, in Western Europe, but they are low, right? They're relatively low. And the murder rate is not that high. If you could plot the um, a murder rate per thousand or per 100,000 people in most places in the United States on the y-axis, most places will be down there, around the national average in there, the national rate, or below the national rate. And only a few of them will be above that, right? But not many. The challenge is that there are places in the United States that are 
extreme values that are outliers. There are certain cities, certain towns, certain neighborhoods in the United States that they have become so dangerous in the past three or four years that it will go through the roof if we try to plot them on the, uh, uh, on the chart. And those extreme values or outliers, they sort of like a, a twist the national rate. They distort the national rate, right? If you took them out, something that we should not do, obviously, because those are people dying, but if we took them out, the national murder rate will stay the same, or even it, it probably will go down. I don't know. I have not analyzed this data. But the fact is that these outliers are a key element to tell this story. So if you're a journalist and a designer or a graphic designer, your impulse will be to show just this. And if you do that, you are not informing people. You are misinforming people because there is a key piece of information that you need to disclose, which is the role of these extreme values. You cannot show the national rate without at least mentioning the effect of these, uh, uh, of these graphics, or oh, sorry, of these values. You need to increase the amount of information that you show, not decrease the amount of information that you show. How to visualize it? Well, I'm not going to go over this uh, in, in a lot of depth because it's related to things that I have already written. How do you make choices in terms of how to encode your data? Should I use a bar chart, a pie chart, a line chart, etc., etc.? There are certain guidelines that can help you in that, in that choice. And they all boil down the main thing that will give you a reason to choose a particular graphic form to represent the data is the purpose of that visualization. Some visualization writers will tell you pie charts are evil, don't use pie charts, right? Such as this one, for instance, right? This chart is showing um, a, among all the migrants who arrived to Greece in 2016, which percentage came from different countries, right? You can see that half of came from Syria, 24% come from Afghanistan and so on and so forth. Well, this graphic can be good or it can be bad. How to decide that? Well, we need to think about what the purpose of this visualization is. If the purpose of the visualization is to show that nearly half of these migrants came from Syria and the other half came from other countries, this graphic is fine. It could be polished, right, in terms of design. For instance, we could emphasize that message a little bit more by coloring Syria with one color and all the other countries, all the other countries with another color, right? But that is only, the graphic is only right if we think about its purpose, showing half and half. What about if the purpose of the graphic is to compare? If it is to compare, then this graphic is not that great. We have lots of evidence showing that angle and area are not as great methods of encoding as length or height to enable comparisons. Therefore, if the purpose is comparison, maybe a bar chart or a dot plot or a variation of graphic that uses height, length, or position over common axis, that's a better method of encoding than the pie chart. And what if the purpose of the graphic is to show whether there is a geographic pattern of association between the proximity of these countries to Greece and the percentage of people who come from those countries to Greece? In that case, you would need a map, right? So for each one of these purposes, there may be two or three different ways to encode your data, right, or to represent your numbers. And none of them is, are good or bad. In visualization, usually things are not good or bad. They are better or worse, and they are better or worse in reference or in comparison to the purpose, right, in relationship to the purpose that your visualization has. That's what gives you the reason to visualize your things in one way or another. Probably many of you are familiar with these um, uh, resources, which are great uh, to guide our choices whenever we design a uh, visualization, the data visualization catalog, the visual vocabulary, which was designed by the um, a graphics department from the Financial Times. But we need to, when talking about choices in terms of design and encoding of our graphics, we need to go beyond encodings themselves. We also need to think deeply about the way that we sort things, the way that we organize things. Look, the other day, there was a lot of um, controversy around this chart, which was published by the state of Georgia's Department of Public Health, or I think that that was the department that published it. It shows the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in five different counties of Georgia. Each one of the colors correspond to a county. And it seems that, you know, if you don't pay attention to the graph, it may seem that the cases, cases are going down, right? But then once you read the numbers down here, you will notice that the dates are, dates are not organized uh, uh, correctly, right? They are not in order, right? Um, I, you know, I wrote a, a blog post about this graphic saying that, you know, perhaps this sorting is not the most appropriate one, right? And I actually proposed a redesign of that graphic in which I cluster all the bars together, all the bars corresponding to a county. But I also made the following point uh, clear. 
which is that I think that um, people in the visualization community, particularly online, were a, we were a little bit too quick at criticizing the original graphic because we have not considered what it is that the designer of that graphic was trying to do with that graphic, right? It's certainly not good if you want to see change over time. But what about if the purpose of the graphic was to show the highest rates per county and which county was highest on each one of the dates and which one of the dates was highest than all the others? If that is the purpose of this graphic, this graphic works really well. You can see the worst date, the best date, and you can also see what the worst county is per day. So if that is the purpose of this graphic, right, the analytical purpose of this graphic, this graphic is not a bad graphic. It can be improved cosmetically and, you know, in terms of visual design, but it, it does the job. I can clearly see which county was the worst and I can see, actually see which day was the worst, right? It's only that it could be misleading because, you know, this is a little bit clearer if the purpose of the graphic is to show the change on each one of the counties, which is a completely different purpose, completely different purpose. Perhaps the answer in a case like this, by the way, would be to add an interface over here that will let people change the order of your graphics, right? From highest to lowest, from lowest to highest, per country, per, sorry, per county, per date, something like that, and let people choose, let the reader choose how to encode your data. Perhaps my redesign could be the default, but then you can also then, as, as options, you can redistribute your bars in a completely different way, right? If you're interested in research about choosing graphic forms, sorting, how to assess understanding of a chart, et cetera, there's a great website that collects uh, papers about visualization, academic papers about visualization, and also publishes articles explaining, translating those papers. It's called Multiple Views, Visualization Research Explained, which the subtitle basically discloses what the website is about. Uh, so it's a great resource if you want to learn a little bit, a little bit more about the science behind data visualization. And obviously there are plenty of books, right? For instance, one of my favorites in the past few years is uh, Klaus Wilkes' uh, Fundamentals of Data Visualization, which I really like. And moreover, the, the draft of the book is available online for free uh, and legally. You can download it and read it. It's a really, really a great book. Or, or Cole Newsbaumer's Storytelling with Data, that's also a good you know, intro, elementary intro to data visualization, how to make choices whenever we are visualizing data or structuring our information. Six questions, six questions out of seven. What style to use, right? All right, so in visualization, particularly since the, between the 80s and the 90s and perhaps the early 2000s, and in the United States, um, what we could call the Tafti style, the Edward Tafti style of visualization became hegemonic, right? It, it was everywhere, right? It's like, be, just be clear, just the data, um, don't uh, decorate your data, right? We use, you know, um, a, a very toned down color palette, don't go crazy with tons of different colors, blah, 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 which is good advice, I think. But the problem with that uh, orthodoxy of visualization is that, and I'm, I'm, I named Tafti, but I could name many, many other people in visualization who also advocated for that style, they conflated and they confounded their own personal style with the style that should be used. And those are two completely different things. And we need to be clear about that when we read about visualization. If you have a very Spartan looking, very Taftian looking bar chart, and then here you have another bar chart designed, for example, for example by Nadi Bremer, right? Super colorful, super fun, etc. And then you test the uh, success of that graphic, the, effecti the effectiveness of those two graphics. And you notice that both of them are equally effective. You cannot argue that one style is better than the other at all. You can just say that this is the style that I happen to like more, and but you cannot argue you should use it. No, it's just my style. If you want to use it, use it, right? The point that I'm trying to make is that we also need to be a little bit less um, crazy about trying to impose our own way of doing things or visualizing, visualizing things or um, using styles in data visualization. The, the world of data visualization is very, is very wide and there's a lot of space for many, different, for many different styles. And as long as that visual style doesn't damage understanding, any visual style is fine. Any visual style is fine. There are certain things that can help you make choices about visual style though, right? It's like I usually say, for example, that I see the two types of graphics in terms of style what I could call a meat and potatoes graphics, the traditional graphics, right? Bar charts, line charts, et cetera, right? In which are toned down, straight, just the data, et cetera, et cetera. But in visualization, there is a lot of space for innovation, a lot of space for a, a experimentation, a lot of space to expand what is considered acceptable 
in terms of in terms of style. I'm going to show you just one example of what I mean. So this is my friend Jaime Serra, who is a, an extraordinary artist and also an extraordinary infographics and visualization designer. Years ago, Jaime decided that he wanted to visualize how much coffee he drinks throughout a year. Right now. If I had to do that myself, you know, I'm very tafty on in my style, right? I like, you know, these types of graphics, right? I'm not particularly creative. I just like very clear graphics, straight to the point, just show me the data. The way that I would do that would be every day, I would measure the amount of coffee that I drink. I will annotate that, put that on an Excel spreadsheet. And then at the end of the year, I will have 365 records of coffee consumption per day. And I would create a line chart, right? Line chart day by day, that's what I would do. But Jaime, who wanted to experiment a little bit with form, what he decided to do was the following. Every day when he drank coffee, um, he, well, first of all, he got um, 12 pieces of paper, right? 12 large pieces of paper, right? Bigger than this one, but imagine that this is the, this is the size of the piece of paper, right? And then he folded that paper several times, both vertically and horizontally, in order to create quadrants, like if it were a calendar, right? Imagine this paper being much larger, like double or triple the size. And then every day when he poured coffee, we Spaniards love coffee, when, every day when he poured coffee, imagine that my wallet is the, is the mug or the cup that he's using to drink coffee, right? He poured the coffee in and then he shook the mug a little bit in order to spill a little bit of coffee on the sides. And then what happened is that a coffee accumulated at the bottom of the mug or of the cup. And then what he did was to put the mug of coffee on the corresponding quadrant of the page in order to leave a coffee stain on that particular quadrant of the page. And what, the, what he had at the end of the year was a physical visualization of coffee consumption throughout a year, right? January, February, March. Now, this is not a graphic that serves an analytical purpose, right? If you want precision, if you want to see the actual coffee consumption, right? You will need a line chart. That's much better for comparisons. But that was not the purpose of Jaime. Jaime wanted to create something a little bit more expressive, a little bit more artistic, not necessarily analytical. And even if this is not analytical, I can still see patterns. I can still see, for instance, you know, in this month, he was drinking a lot of coffee. In December, he barely drank any coffee for some reason. Maybe he was on vacation. I don't know. I'm not drinking coffee. So you can still see the little stories that hide behind the data in this particular, in this specific case, right? Um, however, right, uh, let me rephrase that. When, when, I, when I present these type of examples, let's say, in a company, right, who has a data science team, etc., sometimes I get a little bit of pushback from the data science team saying, you know, why should we care about this type of more artistic and more expressive graphics? We will never use it. I say, well, yeah, you will never use it 90% of the time, but there will be 10% of cases in which you will use it. And this is the case. Just put yourself in this situation. Imagine that for some reason, you want to analyze how much coffee is drunk in your company every year, every person. And then you gather all the data throughout a year, right? Per person, then you aggregate it by age groups, you aggregate it by, um, by ethnicity, you aggregate it by gender, you have all these huge amounts of data. And then you write a report, right? Like, like a 10 or 20 page report about coffee consumption in your company. What do you put in the inside pages? In the inside pages, you put these types of graphics, analytical graphics, right? Maps, corporate maps, charts, bar graphs, line charts, and so on and so forth. And even scatter plots, if you want to you know, compare coffee consumption to, I don't know, the amount of hours that people are working in order to see whether there is an association. That is what you put on the inside pages. But what do you put on the cover of the report? You don't put these graphics. These graphics are boring. What you put is that, because this graphic, the graphic that created by, created by Jaime, this graphic is amazing. It will capture people's imagination. And that is also a worthy purpose, capturing people's attention to your data. So none of these styles, the more you know, expressive, more experimental style, and the more analytical, toned down, stripped down style, they are not necessarily right or wrong. They may be better or worse depending on the situation and also depending on the purpose of the visualization that you are designing. And the last question, what words should we add? One of the main mistakes that my students make is to first visualize and then add the words. That's not how things should work. Whenever you design a visualization, you need to be thinking at the same time, simultaneously, about the ways that you're going to visualize your data and about the words that you're going to use to put that data in context. Thinking about the title, thinking about the introduction, thinking about the annotations, what we call the annotation layer, right? Hans Rosling, in his presentations, he became the annotation layer 
of his visualizations. And that's the reasons why, reason why those visualizations are so popular. It's not because of the visualizations. Anybody can create a scatter plot, a colorful scatter plot with tons of vowels. I can do that. But what made the difference was Rosling's presence. Rosling's words. Words are incredibly important in explanatory data visualization, right? There is an interview with uh, John Byrne Murdoch, one of the designers from the Financial Times, who has, is becoming really popular because of the great visualizations about coronavirus that they are releasing. In one interview that he, he had a, a years ago, he said, I and my colleagues here at the Financial Times, we really do think that one of the most valuable things that we can do as data visualization practitioners is to add an annotation layer. They put a lot of attention to that annotation layer because again, understanding in the, in the mind of the reader doesn't happen just because of the visualization. It happens because of the visualization plus the words that you put in your visualization, which could be used to explain something, emphasize something, uh, describe how to read the graphic, clarify a particular point that may be obscure, talking about the limitations of the data, and so on and so forth. The visualization itself cannot do that, but your words can. Your words really, really matter. Because the purpose of visualization is not visualization alone. Visualization is just a tool. It's just an instrument that we use to enhance and improve understanding. Right? That's the purpose of visualization. And in order to achieve understanding, visualization alone is often not enough. We need to combine it with other devices. And one of them is words, combining them with the words, either spoken or written. Anyway, so that's all that I have for today. So as I promised, I'm going to stop sharing my screen just for a minute. And then I'm going to go to the question and answers. There was a question, does the dot represent a specific location or a person? I guess that you're referring to the um, Pew Research Center graphic. That was countries, uh, several countries. Um, how can we ac account for the lack of data literacy when doing data visualization? This is from Guido Pizzini. Uh, often we will have the audience telling us, oh, this is too complicated. Oh, what does it actually mean? So what I would advise um, a, for everyone to try to continue making beautiful charts, but keep them relatively simple so that our audience can appreciate them. Well, there's always a balance and a trade-off, right? So don't go too crazy with complexity, but don't oversimplify things either. Try always to find the, the middle ground. And when in doubt, explain things. Uh, remember what I said before about the role of words in visualization. Don't be afraid. You know, some, some visualization designers who, had a bag, who have a background in design will tell you, oh, geography has too, much, too many words. We should show, don't, not tell, right? There's a, this very famous saying, show, don't tell, in the world of design, right? And we need to show and tell. We need to do both things. So don't be afraid of adding, adding words uh, to your graphic, either above or below, or to insert your graphic in a story, and then the, having the story refer to the chart and explain how to read it and emphasize the main points that you're making. Don't be afraid for instance, of repeating the main takeaway of your chart in the title of the chart, rather than writing a descriptive title saying, an employment rate in the United States, 1990, 2010, instead of writing that, that's a great subtitle, but the main title could be the main point, right? In the past two weeks, the unemployment rate in the United States has spiked to 30%. That reinforces what the visualization is also showing. So some people will say, well, that's redundant. We need to reduce redundancy. Well, no, we, we should really not reduce redundancy. Redundancy incre is incredibly important for understanding. So add redundancy, add explanations. Again, don't go too crazy with, um, with innovation, right? Try to innovate, try to try new things, but go little by little. And then try to observe people who you may consider representative of your readership. You can do this either formally and scientifically through focus groups and service and stuff, or a lab, even a lab experiment, or you can just do it informally. Just do, show your graphic to people. Don't bias them, explain them anything from the graphic, just let them read the graphic. And then 15 minutes later, you come back to them and ask them, what did you learn from the graphic? That's a great test. And it is a humbling test because usually, People don't learn from your graphic what you want them to learn from your graphic. <clears throat> While working on data stories, many organizations will tell us that our audience is everyone. Well, it is hard to talk to everyone, right? It's useful, like, you know, in the literature of UX, uh, you learn about personas, right? So it is possible to design visualizations that appeal, appeal to a low common denominator. That is possible. But even in that case, it's also useful to imagine 
ideal people who will read your graphic, right? Uh, Alberto Cairo, 45 years old, you know, college professor, whatever. But at the same time, I imagine, you know, um, Jane, whoever, who is, uh, I don't know, works in this area. So you imagine those, these sort of imaginary personas and you try to uh, design according to them. Everyone is, is very vague, all right? You need, we need to be a little, you need to ask whoever tells you that to be a little bit more specific, a little bit more precise. If you had to ideally, you know, if you had to picture that everyone in your mind, give me examples of three or four people who are part of that everyone, right? That everyone. Um, balance of design and information, right? There was a question about what is my, uh, my, my thoughts about the balance between design and information. Well, design is a lot of things, right? Design is arrangement. Design is sorting. Design is choosing the right graphic form. So in a sense, everything that I have said today is design because design is the pur purposefully, pur purposeful, purposeful uh, arrangement of objects in order to facilitate a task, which in the case of visualization is understanding. That's why we have the term information design, right? Visualization is in, in some sense information design, the purposeful uh, arrangement of objects in order to facilitate the understanding of a topic. But you may be referring to visual design, right? The choice of colors, styles, illustrations, right? Embellishments in your graphics. Prioritize information first, but then if including a, an ornament, a, an illustration, a pictogram, a, you know, a more colorful color palette, a little bit of fun, a little bit of humor here and there, if that doesn't damage your, your, your understanding, if that doesn't harm understanding, then by all means use it because they, that may increase interest on the part of the reader. So that's how I sort of think about that balance, right? I like to read graphics that make me smile, right? If it is, again, about a non very consequential topic, obviously, I will never make fun about coronavirus, for instance. I will be strictly very, very serious. But, you know, read, for instance, you know, the titles that, the headlines that um, The Economist magazine writes for their infographics. They are usually a little joke or a little pun, yeah? those are usually the headlines, and they make you smile. And when you put people in a good mood, right, people are more ready to absorb the information that you are conveying. So good humor is great, right? Animations. Animation, I see animation as I see interaction. Do you need it? Use it. You don't need it? Don't use it. It's like color, it's like interaction, etc. Why using interaction, if adding interaction to a chart forces people to work too hard? in order to extract the information. If you can get away with no interaction at all, don't use interaction. Only use interaction if there is a reason to use interaction, because the data is too complex, because there are many dimensions, because we want people to be able to explore. Does it add anything? Then you have a reason to use it. If there is not a, a reason other than, I like interaction. Well, that's not a great reason, right? So don't use interaction. Animation is similar in my opinion. It's like, does it hinder understanding? Don't use it. Does it help understanding, right? Or it doesn't help understanding at all, but it doesn't harm understanding. And at the same time, it makes the graphic a little bit more fun. Then animation is harmless. You, you can use it because it may increase interest, right? It may increase interest. But the key is always not to harm understanding or clarity uh, too much. Um, there is a difference between static visuals for websites publishing and interactive visualizations such as Tableau but still need to annotate as best as you can. I think so, I think that, all right, so in this presentation, I referred mostly to visualizations for communication, not visualizations for exploration, right? If you're producing visualizations to analyze your data, right, you don't really need to annotate them just because you are going to, you are going to be the audience for that visualization, so you understand what they are showing. Or you can use them with your peers and your peers have the same level of knowledge as you do about what the visualization is showing. Therefore, the role of an annotation layer can be downplayed quite a bit. But if you are going to transform those exploratory visualizations into visualizations that are going to be shown to the public, then the annotation layer is critical. Um, do you have a view of where data visualization goes in the future? Um, I don't know. I, I, I was asked this question yesterday in another presentation, um, and people asked me about VR and mixed reality and physical, you know, physical visualization and stuff and all that is very, is very exciting, but that's not what I want to work on. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in, you know, interested in developing new technologies. I think that we already have great technologies and they are underused. 
And what I see is a growing gap between an elite of people who can use data visualization and take advantage of it, and a larger group of people over here who cannot even read a bar chart or a scatter plot. So that's the innovation that I think that we need to focus on, not developing new techniques. Not the, I mean, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. What I'm saying is that I wish that there would be more attention put on education, literacy, and bringing everybody else up to speed, up to where we are right now. When I say we, I say everybody who is probably in the room today. That's the innovation that I would like to happen in the future. When can we expect your next book to come out? Hopefully, either in the fall of next year or the spring of 2022. Um, we'll see what happens. Right? I'm still... You know, coronavirus has made me feel a little bit uh, unfocused lately. So I've been a little bit lazy. I have made very little progress in the past two or three months, but I'm expecting to make some progress over the summer and then over the fall semester. But it all depends also on the publishers, which in this case, it will be Wiley, Wiley Publishing. So let's see what happens with their calendar because pan the pandemic has screwed up everybody, everybody's calendars. Um, uh, how can you combine different levels of complexity in your graphic? Would you advise aiming at the average reader and hiding the geek information somewhere or using ways to merge them? I am a fan of layering things. So the first approach is the one that appeals more to me. First of all, show me the main takeaways, right? The main things, but always hinting that there is more to be seen. And whatever you put on that first layer of information should be enough. Info so going back, for instance, to the example about um, the um, uh, murder rate in the United States. In that case, I would not show first the um, a national rate and then behind a data of interact behind, behind a layer of interaction, the complexity, the sort of like the distribution, because that will hide very important information. Whatever is critical to understanding a graphic at a first glance, don't hide it behind interaction. Only put it behind interaction if there if it is secondary, right? If it is complementary to what you already shown. Um, how do you persuade your students on context over anything else? Well, I persuade them just by sitting with them and giving them feedback and asking them questions. You know, I'm quite pesky because whenever, whenever students are working on projects, I, we do a lot of review sessions, tons of review sessions. And usually I frame those um, uh, discussions, one-on-one -on -one discussions with each student, each student as a series of why questions. Why? Why are you doing this this way? Why is it this way and not this other way? Why are not you showing this or not explaining this, et cetera? And how am I supposed to understand this if you don't explain it to me, right? So it's all through the conversation and through the interaction, which I see, I see as my role as a professor, not as a professor, right? I see my role as a professor in the classroom as a mentor and also as an editor, a mentor who gives advice and also an editor who asks you the, the hard questions that you need to address in your graphics. It's always useful to see, to have a second or even a third pair of eyes looking over your shoulder and, and talking about to you about what you, are, what you are doing. What is one thing you would love data visualization people to stop doing? Um, I, don't, man, I don't know. I have no idea. Stop doing. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. I, I would need to think about that. Um, there is a more, a need, all right, so there is a more of a need of creating real and original data sets rather than funky data visualization. No one wants to do it because it's dirty work and you don't get accreditation in life. How do you think that this can be addressed? I don't know how it can be addressed, but it's certainly true. I mean, I think that it was Amanda Cox from the New York Times. I think that it was her. I, I hope that I'm not giving credit to, uh, to the wrong person, but I think that it was Amanda who said that the most interesting stories often hide behind the data that has not been collected yet, right? And, um, and I, I completely agree with that. It's like, we, we tend to see data visualizations about certain topics just because the data is readily available, right? And perhaps we, well, perhaps well, connecting to the previous question, this, this question connects to the previous one. What should we stop doing? Well, perhaps we should stop visualizing so often topics that have been visualized so many times before just because the, the data is already available. Perhaps we can all contribute a little bit more to helping you know, researchers, academics, and other organizations you know, donate our time a little bit um, a pro bono uh, to organizations who are making efforts in, in generating more and better, more and better data. I'm doing this these days, by the way. It's one of the reasons why. I am, I'm so busy, even if I shouldn't, I should be writing, but this project is much more interesting. I'm involved in a COVID-19 uh, COVID project 
that is uh, collecting, generating, analyzing, and cleaning up data a, a from Latin America mainly, which is one of the undercover stories right now, I think, in terms of COVID-19. There's a lot of things going on in several Latin American countries that we don't speak about uh, as much as we as much as much as we should. Ah, how do you think that data visualization and infographics created for business and for social good projects are different? Well, I don't think that they are different in, in, in many different ways. They should all be truthful, they should all be clear, they should all be attractive and, and nice looking, etc. They should not lie. They should not hide information, right? Sometimes the difference is that they do, right? Sometimes business graphics show you the information that the designer is interested in showing and concealing the information that is inconvenient. But you know, I, 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 the journalist in me says you should not do that. I mean, if your data is inconvenient, you need to show it just because it's, it's critical to understanding that, that story. How a small data visualization studio can become more famous and get more clients? Well. I, 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 it, this is a no-brainer, I think, the answer, but it says producing work. And then producing work that matters, right? So, you know, again, um, perhaps doing some pro bono work for uh, non-governmental organizations. The other day I was contacted by a, a, a very nice gentleman who runs several small uh, non-governmental organizations that do humanitarian work in West Africa. And I recommended a couple of the students of mine who are going to produce visualizations for that organization, right? And that's an opportunity, right? It's data that is not being visualized by anybody. Someone is going to visualize it. That may put you on the, may put you on the map, right? Put you on the map. Um, and try to be, at the same time, clear and creative, right? It's like, what makes you different? What is, differentiates your body of work? Is it the clarity and the precision? Is it the beauty, the beauty of your graphics? What is it that makes you distinct? For instance, I, I have very few um, expertises, I would say. I am not a great designer. I am not a great artist. I am not a great, although I can, I can sketch things out. I, I was just sketching out while I was on the phone before uh, this a random portrait of a RPG, a role-playing game character. Uh, anyway, so, I can sketch things out, but I'm not a great artist. I'm not a great designer. What I can do really well for some reason, perhaps um, that comes from my past, because perhaps this is something that I inherited from my family, particularly from my dad, or it, perhaps because I like to read a lot. I, I become quite good, perhaps not as good as, as other, many other people, but quite good at translating information at reading a huge amount of information and being able to extract the key points from it and then arranging those key points into a narrative that a normal person can understand and I think that that's what makes me distinct to other to other people but that's just one of the many things that may differentiate you from other people so not a great designer but I can always collaborate with great designers not a great artist but I can always hire you know Nadi Bremer or Jaime Serra or whatever to do the, uh, that hard work for me, <laughs> the beauty of the, of the graphic. But uh, what I can do is to tell a story, that, that I can do. And so try to find what you can be good at and go all the way for that without forgetting that it is also good to acquire a working level of understanding of everything else, right? So learn some coding, learn some design, learn to write, learn how to write well. That is critical to be a visualization designer. And read books. That's something that I recommend all my students whenever I ask, what is, the, what is the best advice that you can give me? Read books. Read nonfiction books. And get used to extracting the main points of those books. Make a lot of notes. Then write a, a report for yourself. Just one paragraph. Trying to summarize what the book is saying. That's how you train your brain in being concise when telling, when telling a story. Anyway, I'm rambling a little bit. Let me see if there are more questions. Um, uh, the, the, the young people. Well, I have to just say that. It's like, you know, choose one thing that you can be very good at and be really good at that, but without forgetting that you also need to acquire some at least elementary understanding of design, story or narrative, um, coding also, etc. Don't go crazy about choosing one coding language or another. Some people will tell you, oh, R is better, or oh, Python is better, or, you know, D3 is better, whatever. Just go for whatever you feel better with. As long as it gets the job done, that's what really matters. So whatever suits you better. I happen to like the R programming language quite a lot. I use it for a lot of, a lot of different things. And I suck at D3. One day I need to solve that. One day I will be able to design in D3 at last. 
Um, should data visualization strive to include analytical results? For example, results of inferential, uh, inferential statistics whenever applicable. Well, perhaps not at the get-go, there is like at first, but certainly as a um, um, documentation layer or explanation layer, where these data come from, what it means, et cetera, et cetera. This is something that more and more media organizations um, are doing more and more. For example, ProPublica. ProPublica, whenever they publish an analysis of data or a, a data-driven story, they have a methodology section in which this, they discuss the analytical part of the, of the project, right? For the geekier side of their, their readership and also for the sake of transparency. That's an exercise of transparency, right? When can we see a Dungeons and Dragons data visualization from you? Well, I don't play Dungeons and Dragons. I tend to play one uh, role-playing game called RuneQuest, which is a little bit, a little bit more obscure, perhaps. Um, uh, you may not see a visualization about Dungeons and Dragons from me, but you may see perhaps a role-playing game book from me at some point in the, in, in the next year or so. We'll see. Um, opinion and what is right to show the percentage difference between the daily confirmed cases and the recover. I mean, these are two variables comparable or not. I have no idea. I, I, I would, I, I, and this is something I recommend everybody. When in doubt, ask a ask a, a biostatistician or ask, a, or ask an epidemiologist. I don't know. I cannot really answer that question, right? Always, and this is one of the things that also I would recommend people in visualization to do more. There was a question before, what would you recommend people to do more, right? Consult with experts. It's like every, every book that I write, every visualization that I create, everything that I work on, I always give it, I have a list of friends in different areas of expertise, PhDs in, you know, a, a, climate science, uh, physics, uh, statistics, uh, biostatistics, engineering, et cetera, et cetera. And I have that list of friends because I can bug them. I say, you know, oh, I'm working on this. Would you mind taking a look at it and let me know or ask this or answer this question uh, because I have this doubt, et cetera. I just assume that um, uh, embrace epistemic humility. You cannot be an expert at everything and assume that you always will need to collaborate with somebody. So that, this is a great example of that. I don't know. Just ask those who know. Uh, can you still be a good visualization designer if you're not good at sketching? Yes, you can. People are sketching many different ways. Moritz Stefaner, one, probably one of the most famous, talented visualization designers out there, he doesn't sketch by hand. He sketches through Tableau. I don't know whether he uses also processing or he used processing at the time to sketch ideas out, but he certainly uses Tableau to sketch things out. He's super talented. There may be people who sketch out with D3, I don't know, I'm, or, or with R. I sketch out with R, right? I create my base graphics in R. They look terrible, right? Tons of different colors. But then I style them, right? I style them to, to make them look uh, better. So certainly there are many ways in which uh, you can sketch things out, not just by hand. A um, lot of folks are keen on publishing Tableau public to showcase their work. How do you think that this can be repurposed for social good? Uh, I don't know. I think that publishing in, for example, in the Tableau forums is fine, just because that, that tends to be read just by people who work in that in the Tableau, in the Tableau communities. Perhaps one way to sort of like make that work a little bit more public is something that I mentioned before. Try to partner up with NGOs and you know governmental and non-governmental organizations that are doing work for the public good. That could be the answer to that question. Um, Oh, uh, information games that you think are interesting. Um, I don't know what, I think that all games that I play are, inf are informational in some sense. I'm a huge fan, for instance, of historical, uh, historical games. Um, so I'm thinking about, for instance, um, I've been playing recently with some friends of mine uh, to an old game called the Age of Renaissance, which is a simulation of the Renaissance, the commerce in the Mediterranean in the Renaissance. You learn a lot of geography through that. You learn a lot of history. I've been playing also with another game titled Here I Stand, which is a simulation of the wars of religion in the, fourth, in the 15th and the 16th century, the rise of Protestantism and the fight against Catholicism. And it's very, it's very educational. You learn a lot through that so the cards of the game. Oh, I didn't know that this event happened in this particular year or whatever. And it, one of the, uh, I see games as educational tools in many different ways. One of them is to learn history, particularly if you, if you uh, play historical games. Also to learn about probability 
Yesterday I tweeted an example of a person who didn't understand probability and I joked, perhaps playing more Dungeons and Dragons could help because you will understand how often you will roll a one in a one in, in, in a dice of 20 sites. It's very, it happens very often. It's a 5% chance, but it, it will happen, right? So you will learn how often you will roll that one in your D20. And, and also because playing games is stimu stimulates not just the imagination, but it prompts you to seek more information. So for instance, in college, when I used to play much more than I do today, when playing historical board games, for example, I used to read books that were related to that particular topic. I would play a simulation of World War II. Well, I read like 20 books about World War II just to get into the sort of like in the mood of playing the game. Same thing with this here I stand simulation. I started reading about, the, um, about Europe in the, um, in the 15th and the 16th century just to learn a little bit more about it. It prompts you to educate yourself in order to enjoy the game even more, even more. Uh, acquiring all types of skills. I sort of answered this, this question before. I think that you need to acquire a working understanding of everything that is involved in data visualization, data interpretation, data analysis, you know, a, a little bit of coding, narrative, writing, design. You need to acquire a working understanding of all that. But then you need to choose. It's impossible to be great at everything. Impossible. So you need to choose one or two areas that you could really excel at because more, more often than not visualization design nowadays is um, teamwork, is a product of teamwork. <clears throat> what do you think differentiate a data visualization practitioner from a data visualization artist? The purpose, right? The, the purpose of a data visualization artist is the expressive power of the piece or the, or the innovation or the um, um, experimentation with the form, etc., and that is fine. The purpose of a visualization practitioner can also borrow a little bit of that. There is always art in visualization, whether we like it or not, right? There's something, there's always a little bit of beauty, or there should always be a little bit of beauty in our graphics in order to make them, in order to make them attractive. But the main purpose of a visualization designer should always be clarity and depth, both of them going together. How do you structure the insights, ideas, references when working on a project? I always begin not by visualizing anything. I always begin by writing. I always begin by writing memos to myself. When I read all the information, I always have a pen, pencil, or whatever, a piece of paper, and I take lots of notes. And then I organize those notes. I create a hierarchy of those notes from the most important to the least important topic that I want to talk about. And that's sort of like very, doc very, very, very rough document that I create is what usually serves as the skeleton of the, of the visualization. Advice on how not to break copyright uh, when using COVID-19 data. I'm fortunate that I cannot help with that. When in doubt, always ask. So just contact the authors and read the fine print, but you know, talk to people, talk to people. That's what I would recommend. <clears throat> 